Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar with Gab with your Gad, Eric Myers. Thanks for being here. Glad you're, you've been able to join us today. Eric's got some great content to cover, as always, uh, with the ever-changing information and what's going on. Um, please use the chat box if you have any questions. And I want to give a shout out before we start to um, consider the New Agent Academy. If you have anybody in your office that's new or um, just starting their career or has taken some time off and is getting back into the industry, great uh, content covered over eight weeks, really to set you up for success. So please consider that and share that with others. We, we also have some great content this week. Um, we've got a Habitat for Humanity um, webinar this week that will highlight a lot of information that may help with some of your clients. Got some uh, financing options that are quite worthwhile. And uh, David will be on a webinar this Thursday. Always great content with David. And uh, be sure to just check out the MAR website. Lots of great offerings and uh, topics covered there as well. So I will be manning the uh, behind the scenes here. So please let us know if you have any questions. Um, Eric is great about stopping and answering any questions you may have. And it's really, idea is to be interactive, to um, just hit him up with whatever questions you may have. So I will turn it over to you, Eric. Okay, sounds good. There we go. Well, this is Gab with your Gad, and uh, we've been kind of working this out over several weeks, and we've changed it a couple times. We've got this new name just a couple weeks back, and we, as uh, Amy said, we really want to truly make this interactive. There's been a lot of slides during this time. Uh, we really do value the conversation with the members that are on the calls, uh, but this is also being recorded as well, too, so uh, nice that this can be re-accessed, and I know a number of members have some ongoing conflicts but uh, that they've made it a habit to come back and, and review these slides every week so that they always have kind of a touchstone to what's going on in, in the government affairs world. As a reminder, this isn't government affairs or government affairs sake. This is government affairs for real estate sake and for your business. So, and also with that, I'd like to thank our uh, four sponsors, Bell Bank and Mortgage, North Star MLS, Royal Credit Union and Supra. And without their support, we couldn't deliver this content um, in the same, valuable and critical way that we can with their support. Um, so thanks to them as well. I'm gonna get started and then again, yes, chat box, <clears throat> click. I really do want questions throughout. We can take questions at the end as well. Um, but I'll uh, just, there is some new content and it's kind of, there's some evergreen content, but there's also some content that changes from week to week. So I might speed up in some places and slow down in others, so. Just to get started, my name is Eric Myers. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the Minneapolis Realtors. Uh, and I've got a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Minnesota. I started out east, but it turned out that my undergraduate degree was gonna be more than a home loan if I didn't come home. So I came home and I've been actively lobbying in Minnesota for 20 years. And I've represented the Realtors for 12 years since February, 2008. So since prior, just prior to the last crisis um, or right as the last crisis was starting um, and uh, yeah, so I worked in the Minnesota House, Minnesota Senate. I was legislative campaign staff, so I was paid to go to everybody's doors in a couple different districts in the state. And I worked on a statewide issue advocacy campaign, Freedom to Breathe, Smoke Free Bars and Restaurants. And then I worked as, as a gopher, or as they called an executive assistant in the advocacy practice of a large law firm. And I really got exposed to the business of advocacy and uh, what it takes to write and execute contracts there. And then also, but um, how to serve a wide variety of client needs um, from a capital-based advocacy practice, uh, but then back to their boardrooms and their company uh, uh, where it impacts them. My role Eric, in the bank. Yep. I'm so sorry. Your slides are not showing. They're not. So sorry. Okay, I got to go back. See if I can exit. Share. It looks so large on my screen that I, I thought it was, it just looked that way, huh. There we so. go. We could have let you keep going because you've got great content, but I thought for sure yeah. you've spent all this time with these slides, we should see Well, it, it was weird because it looked, I've got the two screens going and it and definitely was on presentation mode on my side and it looked like it was coming through the app, but I guess I, I, I did miss that step. So appreciate it, thank you. 
Uh, so yes, uh, my usual role is to represent realtors at the city and county level and to see what their what cities and counties are doing that might have a positive or negative impact on realtor business. Uh, my approach during the pandemic is to be a little more holistic with our delivery of government affairs, news, services, and information to keep you updated on what's going on at all three levels of government. Um, definitely the U.S. House, the Senate, uh, Minnesota House and Senate, executive orders, new guidance from HUD, IRS, Treasury, and others. And then monitoring of the, not the protests themselves, but the impacts and the results of protests, violence, curfews, and other government response. So just kind of a whole host of things right now that maybe goes beyond the, the usual role. Um, resources, places you can land. The National Association of Realtors has a great page. Minnesota Association of Realtors has a great place. And the MAR COVID-19 resources has a nice page. Maybe an additional uh, line item for next week is that there's also a great place to land on MAR's website in terms of a response to the unrest in Minneapolis. And, and so uh, in, in places that you can really dig in and then you can personally step up and make a difference. If you're out there trying to read the tea leaves and figure out what's going on, but also trying to find a place to give back, uh, you can land on Mars website and navigate to a page um, that can help you connect in those areas too. And that's, that's pretty important stuff right now. Um, stay at home orders, realtors are essential. The association staff, not so much. So our, our, our locally, it's the impact, you know, we still have hours where you could come see us on Thursdays and we do kind of uh, drop off transactions with our memberships, uh, with our membership. And, uh, but uh, so our association is still following CDC guidelines. Um, and, but this was, this, this thing was meant to talk about you, you know, Guidelines can change over time. We have seen them change. They haven't changed for you yet. You are essential. Please uh, be safe when you're out there. Wear masks, touch as few surfaces as possible, and try to, a try to avoid negative PR with too many people gathering in one place. I know even with the reopening now, there's a lot of questions about what is and what isn't okay. And there's a lot of places, and some of those will be covered in this presentation, where you can learn more about what's acceptable and how to follow along. Um, foreclosures and evictions are still uh, suspended. There's presidential and governor uh, orders. We'll talk more about that. Uh, stay, stay safe and some of the executive orders. We'll talk some of the, about some of these items in detail here. <clears throat> stay safe updates from the governor's office. There is testing available. Um, they do want you to stay at home, but don't stay anywhere unsafe. So if, if, you're, if you or anyone you know, your clients or anyone is suffering from um, domestic abuse, there are resources. Unemployment support, support, click through here to go to DEED's website. Remember that the $600 federal boost will expire uh, at some point in July. And mental health, if you have mental health issues or you need resources, the Minnesota Department of Health has put a list of resources available here. Child care, housing, emergency food support, wearing masks in public, all, all, all more information that's available at each of these uh, pages. And the links are all active and work. Um, there's some new guidance from DEED on safely returning to work. Um, and then for the workers themselves, some guidance on safely returning to work and what's expected and for the businesses safely returning for work. So a couple different links here with a little bit of interesting or neat iconography. Maybe you think so, maybe you don't, but uh, just some places to land in terms of what's, you know, following and knowing what the latest guidance is. Um, the peacetime emergency was extended and, and it is now extended through July 13th. Um, part of the reason the governor did order the, um, did order the special session when he did. Um, so executive order 2075 extends the peacetime emergency and, and executive order 2014 suspends evictions and writs of recovery. So you can't evict somebody and you cannot begin the foreclosure process at this time in the state of Minnesota. Um, there was another executive order just under this one, 2075. The 2074 requires um, 
critical sector workers to adopt a preparedness plan. There was a memo crafted by Chris Galler and Susan Diori. This is uh, um, guidance from the state association that a lot of real estate offices are gonna wanna follow. Um, so the latest executive order 2074 allows for business workers qualified for the critical sector exemption to continue operating in the same manner and following a summary of the key components here. Uh, if they cannot do telework or virtual work, work can be done or cannot be done outside of their home. Um, there is a travel restriction in place. When work cannot be done at home, you must follow the guidelines and you have to have a preparedness plan. You have to build a preparedness plan and you have to have that preparedness plan done by June 29th, 2020. It is not required to be turned in anywhere um or submitted for acceptance by the state but if if the state were to show up at your business and demand to see your preparedness plan you are required to have one completed by june 29th um, and on file at your office so work at home whenever possible uh, uh, ensure that sick workers stay home uh, show that you're following the social distancing guidelines uh, worker hygiene and plans for source control, cleaning, disinfection, and ventilation protocols. So all of these items need to be in your plans, and then your plans need to be on file at your association. If you have more questions about this, please contact Chris Galler or Susan Diori at the State Association, or if you're a broker, check with the Minnesota Legal Hotline, and they can walk you through uh, some of this information. So, but this is the extent of what they have to share right now. So. Uh, data dashboard, I updated some of these numbers, 31,000 confirmed cases, 1,300 deceased, and, and a good recovery number too now, uh, 27,404 that have been released from isolation, and then county by county links as well, uh, the case counts and information. All of this is available on their dashboard, the state's dashboard. Um, this is total confirmed cases by exposure. So if, if, if it was a healthcare staff member or if it was congregate, let me see if I, pointer options, laser pointer. If it was in congregate living, if it was in healthcare, healthcare staff, or if it was a community and the source was known, or if it was a community transition and the source was unknown. So here's some of the breakouts. Um, and then here's the age strata, different age levels, and who's gotten the cases. So you can actually see the highest number of cases between 30 and 39. This is not the highest number of deaths uh, by any means. It's obviously been impacting an older, older cohort, cohort in terms of uh, deaths, but total number of cases are in some young, younger demographics here. Uh, cases by race, just some information for you there in case you're interested. And then the Minnesota Stay Safe Plan, which has not changed in a few weeks. The association did put a message out on the death of George Floyd and um, is, is planning to do a large scale grant uh, to work on some of the injustices in our, in our present system. Uh, and then a smaller grant to, to help do some cleanup in some neighborhoods. Uh, $3,000 grant from NAR, kind of for paint removal, new paint, cleaning a park or something like that. And that work is also being identified with the association and some number of members on the task force. Um, obviously there's more to say here. I just, there's just, what more can you say? So um, some unemployment numbers, just comparative it in our, in our four state region, you can see Michigan up over 20%. You've got Wisconsin uh, edging up towards 15%, South Dakota even over 10%, but Minnesota overall not even touching the 10% mark yet. Uh, this is uh, data from the Federal Reserve through April, um, or through May here, I believe. So, and then you have a chart on initial claims for unemployment, but then some, you know, there's a, a separate line here for kind of continuing claims. I do have it on good authority, the Minnesota, uh, uh, so the Minnesota unemployment account is empty and it's now gonna be backstopped by the federal government, which is typical in a time like this with an extended unemployment, but um, also on the other side of the coin, um, 
doesn't happen all, I mean, it's typical that the federal government always backs up the states, but it's not very typical that the state runs out. But it's, it's this line, this continuing claims number that's draining those accounts so quickly because you have a large number of people utilizing the unemployment claims for an extended period of time. And then just obviously, this is new data from the Federal Reserve as well, but you know, we obviously kind of all intuitively know what sectors have been hit, artist, food and lodging, entertainment, retail, healthcare, just some places that you couldn't go during the pandemic. And obviously they've, they've had um, layoffs of work, you know, the workforce levels have been dramatically impacted by some of these, uh, in some of these sectors. The National Association of Realtors has developed a guide that you can use to talk with your consumers about forbearance. If they're having trouble making payments on their homes and they wanna know what their options are, certainly they should and could always turn to their realtor uh, and their realtor is in a good position and give them great advice about what to do uh, about some of the challenges at home and relating to home and relating to their real estate. NAIR put this four page guide together. It's available at this link. Pass it around in your offices, use it. Uh, have people in your offices use it. It's a great conversation starter and you can really uh, start here and then really find a way to help people. FHA did announce <clears throat> that if <clears throat> upon the completion of a forbearance and uh, three consecutive payments thereafter, FHA in terms of uh, purchase finance uh, or refinance, would look at the forbearance as if it never happened after that point. Just be aware of that. Unemployment and stimulus, the, a lot of us are quite familiar with this stuff now, um, but just remember the $600 federal boost is set to expire in late July. The U.S. House did pass a bill that would have extended the federal boost through January 2021, but the Senate the U.S. Senate has not acted yet. And that legislation in the House is called the HEROES Act, and the Senate has not worked, has not yet taken up the HEROES Act. And uh, oh, it's, it's, we're not sure whether they will or not. Something to watch. Um, check your mail. Uh, this, there was some stimulus that was still going out, um, and IRS employees are back to work. And there's some information about Deceased persons, if you are the executor of someone's uh, will and they, did, and, and they received a stimulus check and they've been deceased, there's some guidance on that. Late mortgage payments, um, I, you know, unfortunately, as I look at this list and I think back to the beginning of my career with the realtors, you, you can think about some communities that have a high impact of late mortgage payments here right now in this crisis. And I'm, you know, I think of places like Miami and Las Vegas and parts of Texas that was really, really, really hit hard during that early crisis last time. Uh, two percentage points as late on mortgage payments uh, in the Twin Cities, that's up a little bit, um, but then some, some markets with a little lesser impact as well. Um, two percent, that's not a great number. You know, we'd like to see that as close to zero as possible, but it's also not one of the, these higher numbered, worse, worse numbers in terms of submarkets. Unemployment rate in April, just under 10%, 9.9, and the US was 13.3%, and then some of the raw numbers as well. This is from the deed uh, release. And then you can tell sector by sector who's having the worst over the year job. This is usually over the year job growth, but in this case, uh, with all negative numbers, it's over the year um, job retraction. So uh, logging and mining, construction, manufacturing, look at the trades and transportation and utilities down huge, education and health services. A lot of the health systems have, were furloughing people for a long time. Hopefully some of that reverses very soon. Um, financial activities, uh, information that would include like IT and researching and research is, is down quite a bit. And leisure, leisure and hospitality, obviously mega impacted here as well, mega of 141,000. So that's just year over year. So that's the most recent month compared to this month last year. Um, and then some more numbers here about some of the um, 
major metros throughout Minnesota. So Minneapolis, Duluth, you know, and some of the more um, out greater Minnesota metros. So some impacts in other parts of the state here as well. Pandemic of an assistance, unemployment assistance, realtors have been eligible for unemployment assistance. I've talked to a number of members that have applied, received unemployment, and then, then they got a commission check, and then they were back on unemployment the week after and on and on. Um, lots of information, click through here, and they can walk you through that process. Any questions at this point so far? actually have a quick one that's related to the stimulus. I heard, and I want to know if what you've heard, if anything, um, that there's possibly on the second stimulus and then there's going to be some encouragement to do some travel. Have you heard anything about that? Uh, yeah, I, you know, there's, there's a new set of ideas every few days that comes <laughs> out on, on what the stimulus could be. Yeah, and I did hear you know, and, and I don't know what form that ends up taking. I'm sure that's part of the of the concern. Um, but you know, there was some talk at the congressional level. How do we how do we get people moving again? How do we get people, you know, uh, you know, taking the vacations and and you know, I think they're worried about the hospitality industry. They're worried about the travel industry. How do we get people back, um, basically flying again or driving again or uh, heading to destinations, spending money on hotel rooms in kind of the era of COVID. And, and you know, mm -hmm. we're worried about every surface we touch, but um, and I think it's very, very personal to each and every single one of us. When would you feel comfortable staying in a hotel again? Last week, this week, next weekend, two weekends from now, a month from now, two months oh. from now, six months from now, who knows? Um, I know a number of those employers and a lot of those companies like Hilton's and others, I've gotten updates from Marriott and others, and, and they talk extensively about some of the cleaning and the and the mm -hmm. changes they've done. So it, yeah, I think there was some discussion about how to get people to take a vacation, and I think what they were trying to do was how do I how do we get people to take vacation and how do we get some of those vacations to be like either uh, tax deductible or <laughs> some amount of credit for it. But you know what, I can't, you know, we're in a really strange territory when the government yeah. starts paying me to take a vacation and well, paying me to, uh, or giving me a deduction uh, and really making me think about that. So, so Jerry uh, just popped in that it's uh, 4,000 per household explore America. He heard yeah. is what he heard mentioned. Which is interesting, interesting. too, because I've, yeah. I've heard it, uh, uh, you know, if people aren't, aren't uh, interested in traveling domestically through by air or internationally through air, then kind of explore the country and maybe that means getting in your car or using a different means of transportation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just, I don't know, you know, if they can't even get, um, if they can't get unemployment extended, I have a hard time seeing them doing anything beyond that that wouldn't include that okay. first. So, yeah. okay, uh, yeah. No, I had heard, question. I had heard pieces of it and I just want to know what you had heard. So thank you. Well, and a couple of weeks ago it was, well, maybe the next, uh, maybe the next stimulus will be 2000 or 3000 or 4000. So yeah, every couple of days, I'm actually subscribed to a number of YouTube channels where they are almost constantly talking about stimulus and the next uh, great idea. And so some of those come from actual bill introductions or discussions from the Hill. And some of those just come from viewers. Wishful <laughs> so thinking, right? Wishful thinking on part, right? I know, right? Um, the uh, small business, small business administration uh, administering the PPP loan program issued new guidance last week, and NAR has updated its PP loan PPP loan guidance as of June seventeenth. A full summary for program de details and forgiveness is available here uh, at this link. Go to this link, and you'll get the full breakdown. And then inside the NAR breakdown is okay, yes, I've had a PPP loan. I had the former documents on forgiveness. Now I want the new documents on forgiveness. Previous to June 17th, it was an 11 page guidance on forgiveness and now it's a 12 page guidance. So there is new information in there. Guidance has been streamlined. You wanna make sure you're following the most recent updates on that, on that forgiveness piece, filling out the correct form. Don't fill out the old form, get it submitted, have them tell you that you didn't do it right or that you're on the wrong version. 
make sure you're on the most recent version, follow this link and, and let it take you to the correct guidance. I'm gonna skip other CARES Act provisions because we've covered this extensively over the weeks, but it's in here. Um, just know that there's some things in here. <laughs> the Minnesota legislature uh, undone list, you know, special session that wasn't so special ended um, over the weekend here. The undone list includes uh, bonding that they still do, didn't do, legislative oversight on federal CARES Act funding, uh, no further action on police reform, in, at least in terms of a deal of, of uh, legislation or laws that can be changed immediately. I'm not saying that there weren't bills from each side that proposed certain ideas. I'm just saying they didn't get anything across the finish line, past the House Senate, and they're heading to the governor. So this is the undone list here. Um, actually, uh, I want to take this state workers pay raise one off. I believe they did fix that. There is no movement on a tax bill either, and emergency powers have been extended now through July 13th. So um, there's kind of an idea that um, they might perpetually be in government in uh, in special session throughout the summer and the interim, what would normally be the interim, um, and that the government will keep calling them back over and over and over. Definitely this July 13th deadline, the easiest path for the governor is just like he did this month, which was call him in, and then and then he can enact an executive. If if the legislature's in, he can enact an executive order while they're in, and then it takes an action by the legislature to undo it. If he does it when they're not in, it take it reverses that course, and the legislature must be the one that does the executive orders um, and approve it. So, like the the conventional wisdom is now, just before July 13th. The governor will call the next special session. He'll at least uh, extend the emergency powers. They, they would expect he to do that again. And then the, the legislature would come back and do some more work. Whether they would be fruitful on any of the things that we talk about here or any of the things that have been discussed um, to this point, whether there were to be anything additional that gets accomplished and, and how long they meet is all up to them. So and that's all yet to be seen. There was one bill. And Representative Hassan uh, Dia Fowler from Minneapolis in uh, 62A is her district. She proposed House File 83, and House File 83 essentially proposed a residential and commercial um, rent control for a very specific set of, of businesses that were impacted during the pandemic and or during the civil unrest and or if they receive state monies, subsidies, et cetera. Uh, but this would have instituted a rent control for residential and commercial property in these subcategories. So it says in areas impacted by civil unrest. So um, the, state, the state association, your lobbyist team at the St. Paul Capitol, Paul Egger, the vice president of government affairs for the Minnesota Realtors testified against it. They submitted this letter uh, they had some obviously had some concerns with the proposed legislation, and the Minnesota Multi Housing Association also had four talking points here, and they were very concerned about the implication of this of this uh, legislation. This legislation did pass the the Minnesota House um, Judiciary and Civil Law Committee. The motion was to pass it and amended the committee report and forwarded it on to Ways and Means. So this bill is still active, though no companion bill existed in the Senate. There was no motion, there was no movement in the Senate to adopt this bill. But I did wanna let you know that this idea was out there. Um, this bill technically remains active. So if a special session were to, be were to be recalled, the legislation wouldn't even have to be reintroduced. It's still active in the pipeline over there. So just be aware of this one. I'm not sure then it's gonna get through a Minnesota Senate that's that's currently um, that's currently constructed the way it is, but just be aware uh, that there was an attempt at, at kind of rent control for commercial and residential properties uh, through this bill. Any questions there? No? No, I don't see any questions. Okay. Um, Minneapolis mayor's emergency order, anyone over age two who's medically able to tolerate a face covering is legally required to do so. 
There's a lot more details in here about when this uh, executive order started, what the masks have to be, and et cetera. But in Minneapolis, you're required by local ordinance to wear a mask if you're medically able. Just be aware of that. So I guess my suggestion to realtors is if you're in the city and you're and you're using these and, and you're please use a mask because the law requires it. Don't be caught on video not using a mask, uh, considering the law does require it. And the last thing you'd want to do is get called out, on, you know, on on video, online, or otherwise, uh, for not following a local law. Um, and the city of Minneapolis uh, was sued under the Minnesota Human Rights Act, and the lawsuit will assess the priority, the disparities in protected classes. The law scrutiny scrutiny. Um, from the Human Rights Act uh, is supported by the Minneapolis Council and the, the Minnesota legislature is considering a number of policing reforms and was in the special session and probably would continue if the next special session would occur. Um, a couple things from our world in Minneapolis, the renters protection ordinance did start June 1st. If you're a, a landlord and you have not changed your leasing documents, if you're a landlord and you have not learned about the new renter's protection ordinance, if you're a landlord and you have not learned that you can no longer use a credit score, that there's a limit on your security deposits, that you can only look back so far on criminal history, you need to learn about Minneapolis's renter protection ordinance. Um, and we have a blog on Mars website that takes you to all that information and takes you to the places that Minneapolis uh, has created for that information. There's more upcoming webinars for you to access uh, as they're putting those on, as they're continuing to roll out this program. But do, if you know anyone in your office as, that's a realtor that uh, is involved in a residential leasing in the city of Minneapolis, they have to be aware of this new ordinance. So please take a look at that. Minneapolis has enlisted a vendor to study the issue of TOPA, Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act. This is a Washington DC based model that was enacted in 1980, was little known about until mid 2000s. And uh, then the, the Washington DC Association of Realties, uh, Realtors did uh, uh, pass, help the city council and or the, the quasi government in DC change the law and exempted single family. But the city of Minneapolis is looking at tenant opportunity to purchase as a model. Tenant opportunity to purchase quite simply is buildings cannot be sold where a tenant exists unless you first offer the tenant the right to potentially purchase the prop property. And there's timelines and there's delays and we're, we've got a lot of concerns about this. We convened a focus group of five realtors that inserted them, themselves into this, deep, this TOPA um, research uh, that Twin Cities LISC was doing. The, that group has, that uh, work has now ended and Twin Cities LISC is turning their final report and their policy advice into the city by mid-July and a letter uh, from these five realtors expressing their concerns has been penned and signed and turned in and will be part of that final report to the city. Um, there's updates, primers, and talking points about TOPA on the MAR website. So hopefully if that's a concern of yours or you heard anybody in your office talking about it, just know that Mars has gotten, has gotten you the resources there on the website to, uh, to uh, fill your hands with the information you need. Uh, just wanted to talk a little bit, Lawrence Yoon was asked in Forbes magazine about what, what some ideas were for increasing black home ownership. Now this is not based on what Lawrence Yoon himself personally thinks would change uh, or increase black home ownership. Um, his group, the, the, you know, he's the chief economist for the National Association of Realtors and they do surveys every year. And so they go out to the homeowner uh, public, they go out to the soon to be homeowner public and ask them what's keeping them out of housing. And based on the responses of the people they talk to in those surveys, uh, they get this information. So really when Forbes asks him, what are your ideas for increasing black home ownership? He's really taking the survey data and the information people in those cohorts 
have come to them with inside the survey to come up with these answers. <clears throat> and one is, and some of these are simple in terms of realtors who are in this every single day and your mindset is in here and you know what the problems are, but um, we must be kind of diligent and aware that not everybody is thinking about housing every day like we are. So increasing the housing supply. We've had a housing shortage for many, many years now coming off of off the last uh, recession and, and it's been a kind of a result since. Um, but increasing that housing supply, getting a significant new growth and new home construction is definitely required. Um, and, and, and you know, possibly stretching to the next few years is what he's saying. Focusing on opportunity zones, that's that tax program that was enacted in the Tax Cut and Jobs Act of 2017 that helped uh, provide some benefits to people investing in disadvantaged areas throughout the US. So hopefully that creates some commercial avenues and some residential avenues that get people into housing and get people jobs and the capital they need to get into housing. You know, he also had ideas about adapting the credit scoring models. So expand credit scoring to take into account timely rent and utility payments. Currently, renters don't get any credit in a lot of states for utility payments or the rent itself. So you could, you could be a renter for five, six, seven years, always pay your rent on time, but you're not getting any positive benefit on your credit score for being timely with that payment as you would with any other payment that is reflected in the credit scoring. Um, so this, you know, adaptive credit scoring models, some of which do exist and some of which could be uh, implemented on a more broad basis uh, could really help in this sector. And then offering greater down payment assistance, you know, uh, for a population of this country that's uh, suffered systemic racism and uh, generational wealth that has not been built like other, like other races in this country, um, down payment assistance, even three and a half percent of a large mortgage, you know, for our, yeah, of a large mortgage note cost is a significant dollar amount and can uh, take years to save up for. And we know in the in the overall uh, first time home buying population that about 33% of people are accessing funds from their parents or intergenerationally to make that down payment. And just in some in some black home ownership communities, the 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 parents themselves didn't uh, necessarily achieve home ownership either. So there sometimes there just is no wealth to um, to transfer generationally, and the numbers show that. So 33% of the overall uh, is what's accessing down payment assistance from uh, from family. So basically from one generation to the next. But among the black community, only six percent by comparison, are, are receiving intergenerational funds to help them with their down payments. So down payment assistance programs can be very, very helpful to help close um, the home ownership gaps. And then strengthening FHA. Uh, the, federal, the Federal Housing Administration offers loans for first time home buyers and minority households, but fi uh, faced financial hardships over the years. You know, um, you says that you says that shifting federal dollars to strengthen FHA would help lower mortgage insurance premium costs and monthly payments, and that could potentially open a wider pathway to home ownership. So, just a few ideas there that I thought were very relevant to the conversation now. Um, and you know, we can say these things and know these things and believe these things, but you know, when it comes from Lawrence to Yoon's department, that it's based on data and survey information that they received. Um, maybe I'll just do one more slide and see how people are doing. Evolving and emerging issues, definitely the need for systemic change, uh, closing housing gaps in Minnesota. There have been questions about a second round of stimulus and we're still waiting for federal guidance on, on foreclosures, evictions, more state guidance on foreclosures and evictions. And we're continuing to monitor how PPP, EIDL, PUA, uh, potential repayment, forgiveness, how all these policy programs interact with each other. You know, we did find out just about a week ago that PPP is still okay for, uh, for employers that took advantage of payroll tax deferral programs as well. So there was a question at one point whether those two were working well together or not, or whether it would be okay to utilize them both. 
and that one's been answered. So, but there's still a lot of questions about how all these programs work together and how to get your PPP loan forgiven and how to follow through. And then there's still discussions about increased pay for benefits for frontline workers. So with that, I will uh, see if there's any questions. A lot of information there. Yeah, and I, 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 know it, I know it changes it changes subtly from week to week and some things remain evergreen, but I think it's, it's nice to have all in one place, all in one um, uh, presentation so that our members can go back and access it uh, when they are looking for something. Um, and hopefully, hopefully that as the weeks have gone by too, and that we've been updating you on these things, it's giving you a clearer mind as a realtor or broker or someone that works in compliance at a real estate brokerage so that you know where to go out and look for this information as well. So with that, any questions? Yeah, I was just gonna share that Jerry commented that the greater down payment options really would be huge. Yeah, I think so. I, I you know, I couldn't agree more, Jerry. And, and I, you know, I think definitely among certain uh, races as well, but I just think people that don't have down payment assist that don't have can't access it from their family or their family won't or can't or you know and i think some of those just transcend um it's, uh, I, I know they are existent for certain races in uh in our in our population but i i think there's also a piece of it where it just transcends race at some point too you know if if you grew up poor and white in this country um, then you probably didn't have access to a family member that could potentially hand you money for first time home buyer own either. Uh, that's not to uh, minimize one or the other, but the reality is both individuals need help there. So, you know, first time home buyers definitely benefit from those programs. Minnesota accesses those programs, Minnesotans access those programs pretty regularly. A lot of mortgage companies have an entire section of their mortgage company business or individual members on the team that work with people in those spots. And um, if you're a realtor out there and you serve the first time entry level, you know, the first two housing price points on, on David's charts, if you're serving that and you haven't had someone access federal, you know, the, the down payment assistance housing from Minnesota housing or from the federal government lately, then uh, I would just implore you to learn more about it and offer it and see if people are asking you about it um, and just kind of create a connection with someone at a mortgage company that is familiar with it, that does process those loans. Let's get those people in the pipeline. Let's get them in the housing. Let's show them places and uh, let's get them to their first front door so that you can get them to their second front door and many more. So was there an update or a question there? Well said, Eric. Uh, any other questions from our group attending today? Some good content covered, that's for sure. Thank you. Yeah, and again, this will be available on the on the uh, on tray, and you can look back for it on you know on replay. And if you ever have any questions, here's my email address, my phone number. Uh, you know, definitely not physically in the office, but definitely totally responding to emails and phone calls. So I appreciate everybody's time today and thank you for joining me.